We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think uh, hopefully we will have more people joining in, but I will, will start now so that we can get the discussion going. And um, welcome to the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition's annual meeting. My name is Minda Moreira. I'm the co-chair of the coalition, and I will be moderating the first half of this session. And it's great to see so many familiar faces with us today. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, those who are connecting for the first time. So just as a brief introduction, uh, the RPC is a dynamic coalition based at the Internet Governance Forum. And we are an open network of individuals and organizations committed to making human works uh, work for the Internet. Uh, anyone can join our mailing list and uh, I will be sharing the link later in the chat, but you can also find it on our website at um, internetrightsandprinciples.org. Um, and those who would like to be more involved uh, in the outreach efforts uh, are welcome to join our steering committee and we will be um, having um, nominations and elections uh, very soon. Um, so our outreach work uh, draws on the chart of human rights and principles for the internet, uh, which articulates existing international uh, uh, human rights uh, law and norms and translates them to the online context. Uh, so this charter uh, it was published in 2011 and it is the result of an amazing collaborative effort. Uh, with members of uh, this coalition. So the charter is now 10, and today we, we are celebrating the great event with the, this two-part session. The first part is a reflection on the achievements and challenges, and also a celebration of the translation work. And part two, we'll be looking uh, into the next decade. Uh, and then uh, each part will be followed by a Q&A, and uh, of course, we look forward to your uh, comments and questions. Uh, we also expect uh, some discussion in the room and in the chat, and also uh, via social networks. Our online moderator is uh, um, Rashi Saxena, also a part of uh, the coalition. And in the room, uh, I hope that we have uh, June Paris. Uh, please use, use the hashtags DC, Net Rights, Human Rights. And as always, this meeting is being recorded and captioned. Uh, and our captioner is uh, Tracy Renke. I hope that I'm pronouncing right. And finally, and because we are, uh, obviously want to give everyone the chance to participate, uh, we ask everyone to be brief, uh, interventions of around two minutes. And now, and uh, without any, any further ado, um, I would like to go straight to our panel. Uh, and my first guest here today is Marian Franklin, a former co-chair of the RPC, a member of the Coalition Steering Committee and professor of global media and politics at Goldsmiths uh, University of London. Uh, and Marian, uh, you witnessed the birth of the Charter Project and you have been part of this outreach effort uh, for the last decade. Um, can you tell us more about the drafting process and what you consider the main achievements and the biggest challenge for the Charter 10 years on? Thank you, Minda. <laughs> I'm going to share screen. Well, anyway, I was just acknowledging the three uh, leaders, the leadership of three people prior to my uh, chairing, which began in 2012. That's Max Singers, Lisa Warner and Dixie Horton. And the charter, like everything in life, particularly these sorts of undertakings, did not come in a vacuum. It didn't emerge from nowhere, it didn't fall off the tree ready made. It was a long two year effort to get this particular version 
of the Charter um, into a respectable level of legal coherence and acceptance by the very broad ranging uh, membership of the coalition at the time, which was based on a list serve. And that is the basis of our 400, nearly 500 um, members on the list serve. Uh, now. So it was drafted over 2009 and 2010. Um, anyone could take part. It was a bit of a, a policy hack. It was modelled, is modelled on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and subsequent generations of international treaties and covenants, which you can see in the table of contents, and I'll show them shortly. Um, it also included um, acknowledgement of environmental impacts. I only made it to Article 4, Clause B. Uh, it was going to be a whole article on its own, but uh, we're very happy that uh, that explicit recognition was already in there in 2010 and 11. Now, the full charter text was launched, and this is the first photo on the left at the top there. So this is a game for everybody who's been around for a while, spot the person and tell us where they ended up career -wise. So they've all gone on to do great things or retired or all sorts of other things. Um, it was released only in digital form. Uh, and it was accompanied by what we called the 10 punchy principles, uh, a distillation of the 21 articles of the charter as a very effective, it turned out, promotional and awareness raising document. That was instantly translated by um, volunteers into 26 languages. And in 2014, which is the, um, the, the, the compiled compilation slide on the right, uh, we got the charter booklet underway, mainly to, to, to realize that um, a digital document in itself may be necessary in a digital networked environment, but was not sufficient for every form and format and platform and levels of access. So the booklet took shape as a hard copy. And now it is in digital form and you can access it digitally or you can contact us and we can send you a printed copy. So what is the charter? Just to remind ourselves, those of us who were there from the beginning, and there are a few of us in the room, um, the idea was to try and come up with a comprehensive framework anchored in existing human rights law for emerging challenges in what um, was called and still is in many places the online environment, um, to be a shared reference point for dialogue and cooperation across sectors. This is quite distinct from the very important, powerful advocacy documents that preceded the APC Bill of Rights, the Communication Rights and the Information Society campaign, and many others before, during, and since the Charter was released, to be shared reference point, particularly from a legal point of view, to be authoritative in that respect for framing rights-based norms for internet policy making, and also to be not only an advocacy tool, but there are many already are doing very good work there, but to be an educational and policy making tool. Because uh, judiciaries, uh, politicians, uh, regulatory agencies still had to be persuaded uh, that um, this was actually worthwhile. Uh, because it wasn't obvious 10, 12, 11, 12 years ago. Um, why we should think about human rights law as it currently exists in all three, four generations through a digital network lens. And anyone like myself who took part in that very first drafting when we took the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, unpacked at each of its 30 articles and tried to revise it, not, not rewrite it, but to rephrase it so that it made sense what we understood 10 years ago was important digitally. Uh, well, I'm sure I'm not the only one who realized what an extraordinary piece of writing the original Universal Declaration was and still is. So it was honed down to the form it's in, checked for its legal uh, coherence, its legal authority, um, argued over passionately um, in the form you see now. And it's for that reason, it's rather, if you could argue, slightly conservative approach. It wasn't talking about new laws, um, not literally new rights. It was trying to articulate and translate, if you like, transliterate existing human rights ideas, expressions, and, 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 and uh, standards into a form that people who were online and working digitally could understand. So it was, it was very clairvoyant in many ways. Um, and it was setting the bar. And I think in that respect, it's been extremely successful. And that has been its main achievement, Minda, actually, um, its ability to actually be taken seriously by lawyers, by judiciaries, um, and by any number of people for whom this work is now a priority. And human rights is now the epicenter of everything to do with internet governance. So that's its biggest challenge. 
actually, I believe um, that was one of the questions, Linda, if I can finish with this point, is uh, maintaining the superior material support we need to, to translate, to print, and to reach out um, and work with local communities on all these different translations. And I'll chip in where there's space and time um, with the following speakers, because the translating of the charter into different languages is the work. Uh, each language edition has its own stories, and we're going to hear some of that today. Uh, Thank struggles. You. Thank you, Marian. I will have to cut you there. Yeah, <laughs> really <that's> sorry. <laughs> but. Thank you for, for the great uh, introduction and insights. I'm really happy to see that we also have uh, more people in the room that were involved uh, from the beginning, including Henriette. Uh, hi, Henriette. And uh, I would like to ask you another second question because uh, you mentioned and well that the charter is now also available in print and it has been translated into uh, 11 different languages. And, uh, and Marianne, you have been the driving force behind the Charter Booklet project. And you have been also coordinating the, the translation work. And, and so I would like to ask you, why, why does it make a difference to have a printed charter in this uh, digital age? And also how important um, do you think it is to have the, the, the charter translated into other languages? Thank you. Oh, because you can hold it in your hand. You can hold it in your hand. You can open it. You can write in it. You can bend it backwards. Put it under your jumper to protect yourself when it's cold, if you're on your bike. It's a very powerful thing. It's a material article, but it is also very powerful in digital form. So it's not an either or. And it's only when the booklet edition took off, we realized that the materiality of this work is this is one format. The other materiality is digital, but we couldn't reach out in the way and contact communities for whom um, the internet is still a, you know, out there in the dream world, unless we had sort of hard copy and versions of that hard copy. So just quickly, the translations, as I just said, are everything. They are the heart of the work. And I only realized that as we got on to uh, half dozen languages, when we got the Arabic version, when we heard about the struggles with the Turkish version, when we had the Spanish presented to us um, out of the blue and then it got presented to the Spanish Senate uh, where people got back and said we don't know how to translate these these fancy terms we don't know how to translate disability in Arabic because it's a tricky word um, and that's how people got engaged and got into it and that's how students have engaged and got into it and, and from that point I'll stop because I know our next speakers will tell us about some specific um, um, challenges to and excitement and the thrill of translating something, translating meaning you know making sense of it. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, and uh, we actually very lucky to have uh, here with us a few representatives of the charter translation teams, and uh, to share more about their work and what it means to translate these documents. And uh, last June uh, at the Eurodic, uh, we had the soft launch of the Italian charter. And we are happy to welcome the coordin coordinator of this uh, translation project, Eduardo Celeste, uh, who is assistant professor in law and technology and innovation at the School of Law and Government of Dublin City University. Um, Eduardo, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, your team did such an amazing job with Italian translation. And, and it was really a great uh, collaborative effort. Um, so can you tell us a little bit uh, more about the, uh, the, the Italian translation process? Thank you. Yes, sure. So hello, everyone. It's really like a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. And uh, many thanks I mean, to, to Minda and Marianne and to all the people involved in this dynamic coalition for all the amazing work that you have been doing over the past few years on the charter. So we've been inspired by your work. And this is why in the first instance, we volunteered to translate the, the charter into Italian. We felt that actually um, our language was missing among the many translation. And especially we felt that actually, um, as uh, Marianne said, uh, I mean, the translation itself is extremely helpful to get into the minds of, for example, law and policy maker judges to speak their own languages. Um, so first of all, there was a sort of like theoretical motivation also behind uh, this uh, 
as you said, a collaborative effort. I will say a couple of words about that in a second. So we felt essentially there was a discrepancy between uh, constitutional language uh, uh, expressed in the Italian language uh, related to digital rights and the content promoted by the charter. So we wanted to uh, bring in line uh, this uh, or put forward this conversation about digital rights that was uh, being advanced in the English language and in other languages also in the Italian context. So this was one of the primary motivation of our translation. And secondly, related to the, as you said, the collaborative effort. Uh, indeed, I'm extremely grateful to all the people that supported us in this, uh, in this joint effort because the translation was indeed done by um, several groups of students from the University of Padova and the University of Salerno. And uh, I have also to thank actually my colleagues, uh, Claudia Padovani and Mauro Santaniello, who were the, uh, the teachers uh, involved in supervising the students in these uh, two different universities. And I helped them um, uh, coordinating this group of students uh, and, uh, and achieving the translation. If I have time, uh, I would like to, to focus maybe like to stress a couple of points which were particularly difficult for us uh, in terms of from a translation perspective into Italian that might be even helpful for other people who are considering translating the charter into other languages. So one of the big problems that we had uh, was in terms of uh, um, gender and uh, especially the Italian language, of course, uh, um, we have a sort of like strong, uh, uh, let's say, philomasculine tradition in the sense that most of the um, neutral, apparently neutral pronouns uh, or terms that we use in reality are articulated in their masculine form. So we tried, for example, to bypass this problem by using uh, either the plural or to find essentially new terms that we think are more uh, gender neutral. And uh, we hope that by doing that, we are also sort of like fostering a conversation um, from a legislative perspective, lawmaking perspective in Italy about the use of more gender neutral uh, pronouns uh, generally, also beyond the field of, of digital rights. And, um, and then another important point uh, is uh, more from a translation perspective, uh, the, the fact that in English sometimes some prepositions are missing and we needed to fill this space into Italian. For example, the, um, when you talk about, I don't know, internet rights, so we had to specify where these internet are sort of like placed from a linguistic perspective. So we had to decide whether, for example, these rights were in the internet or for the internet or off the internet and so on. So you will see, I mean, those of you who are familiar with the Italian language, uh, we tried actually to strike a balance between these different uh, um, uh, forms. So for example, in the, in the title, we opted for the four prepositions, so rights and principles for the internet, uh, society, dimension, environment at large. But we see that some other rights are articulated in the internet because we thought that an implementation of these rights in the particular context of the internet is needed. I'll stop here because I'm sure that we have other topics to discuss and many other speakers. Yes, thank, thank you so much, Eduardo. And uh, it's really interesting what you've just said about uh, uh, the challenges with, uh, with the, the language and the words themselves. And, and, uh, and just to follow a little bit up on your remarks, and we also have uh, with us uh, Maria Grazia Valeriani, a uh, student uh, of uh, Global uh, Studies and EU at University of Salerno, and also a collaborator in the translation project. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Maria Grazia. And uh, could you tell us more about the student involvement? And uh, also, as uh, um, uh, Eduardo said, if you um, experience any particular challenges with the translation? Thank yes, you. Of course. Of course. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here sharing my experience. So I will be speaking on behalf of the two group of students of both universities of Padua and Salerno who works on the Italian translation of the charter. 
So let me introduce you very briefly how we managed to work on the project and share a little bit of the challenges we faced uh, during the process. So le let's say that um, I want to start by saying that the time uh, we worked on this project, for many of us, it was the first time we were introduced to digital policy and human rights on the online ecosystem. So um, we had to become familiar at the beginning with the material and read and understand all the charter as a whole, because it was a very vague notion at the beginning for us. But after our first approach of the, on the material, a typical work line for us was, you know, doing translating the 21 assigned articles, we had to create a first draft translation and then we added it to a common document in order to get feedbacks on the quality and the content of it. And we developed different moments of um, briefing and debriefing among the groups. So with uh, a lot of suggestions from students and professors. We also had in our groups um, international students, and that I think that was a great strength for the process because they could um, give their perspectives. They could analyze how the charter was was translated into their modern language, and so we could see some of the mechanisms from an already made translation, and that was very useful, I think, um, also because. You know, we had um, we we could look at aspects with new lenses and building a richer and solid basis for the project. So during the process, of course, we had uh, to face different issues. Some of them were expected; others turned out to be a very challenge. So following what Professor Eduardo Celeste just said regarding the linguistic sphere, of course, one issue was finding the gender neutral terms. As we know, English has a neutral gender language, but Italian was a very difficult um, uh, thing to manage here in this case. So our goal was, of course, to obtain gender inclusion. And we had to choose at the beginning if we want to maintain a neutral noun, so create two different options, so, you know, female and male option, or find the right one that could contain both inclusion and a legal response, of course. And I think that at the end, we, we tried to, we end up with a um, non-gender perspective in our translation and we came up, I think, with good solutions. We tried to take inspiration also from other Italian documents on for this topic. So we are starting to see more and more inclusion in this linguistic area, and we should get used to keep the gender neutral terms uh, in our in all our Italian documents. Another concern, of course, was the legal language because working with Professor Eduardo Celeste um, has been extremely useful to receive his uh, tools, corrections, and a better understanding of the legal code, in Italian legal code, of course. We ended up seeing that Italian has different way of expressing certain concepts. Sometimes it needs more elements. Some other times the expression needs a completely different structure. So the main issue was keeping the original meaning, but at the same time, we have to guarantee the Italian's perspective. And we we know that uh, we for what concerns the outcome as students we were supporting this cause and we felt very um, happy to feel part of this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Grazia, and uh, uh, we were hoping as well to have uh, uh, Carlos Afonso from Brazil here with us today, but I don't think uh, he will manage. Um, so I would like to go directly to Santos, um, because I guess that a lot of the insights that you have been uh, um, sharing with us will be important for his projects too. So um, Santos uh, Sigstel is, um, is a, a RPC a steering committee member and uh, part also of the uh, digital rights Nepal and uh, we are collaborating with them for the uh, Nepali translation of the charter and um, uh, hello Santos I hope you are there still yeah I'm still here Minda yeah. Thank that's you. Great. Thank that's you great. That's great that you managed to join us from Nepal. Is possibly already a bit late over there, um, yeah. and I would like to know a little bit more of what led you and the DRN to start this translation project, and also what is your feedback so far. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minda. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. I'm very glad to be here uh, and represent uh, uh, DRN as well. So we had organized first Nepal Internet Governance Forum in 2017. And that was the first time I heard and I hold this document in my hand. 
So I was amazed by looking at the document and I didn't know about its existence till then, it was in 2017. So that was the, my first encounter with the, this charter. And uh, in, uh, during the lockdown time in Nepal, uh, the discussion around digital rights and internet freedom is very limited. And, uh, but the uses are growing, regulation is slowly come, uh, new regulations are coming, but there are very few people discussing about it. So we, have, we started this initiative, Digital Rights Nepal, and it was one of our, uh, in during the first strategy, strategy meetings and others, we thought that this document would be very useful to promote digital rights and principle in Nepal, because most of the documents are in English and there are very few, and there are, the stakeholders are uh, uh, very limited knowledge about it. We wanted to have something that we can go to people, go to stakeholder and promote discussion around it because we needed it for the policy discourse, for advocacy, for policy lobbying. So it was a kind of a standard tool we were looking for. That's why we approached uh, the coalition and we, we, we requested for a collaboration on translating it in Nepali. So that is the background history. Now the process has started and uh, there are few challenges, few revelation and few technical language related issues because the, uh, the grammatical pattern, the sentence pattern in Nepali is different. Here, the subject verb object uh, is different in Nepali. It's subject, object, and verb. So verb in the last. So sentence pattern is different. And there are few uh, political terms which doesn't make sense if we literally translate. For, for example, uh, the terms like global south and global uh, north, they are kind of political terms and uh, if we translate that into Nepali, literal Nepali, it doesn't give any sense. And for example, the one thing we first encounter is governance. The, there is no concept of the road, no real term for the governance in Nepali. So it is not regulation, it is not administration. So how do we define the term governance was one of the challenges. And lately the team has decided that maybe we could promote the internet governance as a single term using the governance of the English because they, that is getting more popularity. So now we have, uh, as part of the process, we are reaching out to the stakeholders. We will also share the, we have completed the first draft and we'll reach out to, to the stakeholders. And uh, uh, we are also using it uh, for the uh, discussion around the digital rights already. The English document is already in discussion and we believe that having it in Nepali would risk to more stakeholder, more population, and they will be knowing more about the values. Because earlier, as uh, Marianne said, this is a kind of uh, shared uh, reference point. This document would be the shared reference point for the uh, lawmaking processes and the new regulation and about the interpretation of already existing rights in different forms. Thank you, Minda. Thank you so much, Santosh. And uh, um, I can see that the time is flying. So I will open the floor now uh, for any questions that uh, you may have. Um, and uh, so Rashi, if you are there and you have seen any questions, please uh, feel free to let us know, or you can just raise your hand if you would like to do so. And for those who are um, in the room, uh, if you would like to come forward and ask your questions, please do. Um, Minta, I'm not sure, are there any hands online? I'm just looking now at the Zoom session. I don't see any. It's unread here. Um, I just wanted to, to reflect here. And there's a discussion in the chat also about the history of the charter and why it's so important. I think that um, it really is significant. I mean, some of us will remember the history of this actually. Oh, June, you were going to speak. Dates back to the WSIS, the World Summit on the Information Society. And there was a lot of contestation on whether we needed new rights or not. And we had the communications rights movement who felt we needed new rights. And then you had the traditional human rights organizations who felt, no, we've got to look at existing rights and how they comply. 
And in fact, I was at that time of the Association for Progressive Communications, and we decided that we would look at existing rights and reinterpret them for the internet. And we did that in quite a basic way. And then when the IRP started, and it really emerged, this, this, this dynamic coalition emerged from the Human Rights Caucus um, that worked during the World Summit on the Information Society before the IGF was created with people like Miriam Merzuki and, and Ricky Frank Jurgensen. And it was really the human rights experts who said to us, look, use human rights. And we did. And the IRP did that. But I think what's so strong about this dynamic coalition as well is that it was also very much influenced by the work of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee and their 10 principles that they, that they launched in 2011, I think. And which was looking at these rights from the perspective of people working in the internet. And I think that's why this is such a powerful document, because it does bring together that world of traditional human rights, as Marianne was saying, um, but it also speaks the language of people that are working in the internet. And uh, speaking to the questions in, by Monica about, you know, how do we keep states accountable? I think a framework like the IRP Charter initiated the work that has now been taken up by the human rights instruments and mechanisms because we've done this translation and because this charter reflected it so well we got the 2012 resolution at the human rights council now we can go and when we complain about our governments or our states not upholding rights and um, we have these documents to draw on and there's recognition for the fact that offline rights apply online it doesn't mean it's easy but I think it's given us the language, it's given us the tools, and the translation has been incredibly important. And it's given us the, the, the community of people that continue to do this interpretation. And I think that's the interesting thing. It's an evolving thing. Net neutrality was a big issue. Now we're we looking at artificial intelligence. I think there will always be new challenges that we need to look at through the lens of these internet rights and principles. Back to you, Munda. Thank you, Helen Reds, for your great points. And the, uh, I think that we still have uh, we still have people in uh, trying to ask questions. I think Rashi and then Eduardo. Thank you. Rashi, are you there? No, no, I I have no questions. I just wanted to say that the the questions were already answered by Marianne. It's great, thank you. So we can go uh, to Eduardo, thank you. Many thanks, Aminda. Rather than a question, I just wanted to provide uh, uh, my position on what uh, have just been um, said about the utility and the debate uh, between like new rights and old rights in light of the experience that we had of the translation into Italian of the charter. I think that the mere fact that two groups of students from different universities spent an entire semester to understand how to translate simply from a different language into another contemporary language, digital rights written into a charter already can tell you about the, the necessity of doing this work of translation. So in my opinion, the question between uh, uh, old rights, uh, new rights uh, is not the right question here, probably is the false problem. So here there is an, an apparent need of uh, translation. So whether this will lead then to new rights in terms of uh, rights that have not been expressed in this form in the past or not, uh, I think is not the, at least from a legal point of view, the question that we should uh, ask at this moment. In my opinion, I think that we can all agree that a work of translation is needed. Constitutional norms have been crafted for an analog society that doesn't exist anymore. We read them in uh, legal cases, uh, um, pieces of legislation and so on, that very often uh, norms uh, are crafted in a way that cannot directly speak to the actors of the digital society. So I just wanted to stress that in light of the work that we have done with Italian translation. Thanks. Thank you. And, and just before we go to Giovanna, I uh, just uh, wanted to let uh, June uh, in the room uh, go uh, and speak because she was uh, asking for the floor for a little bit now. Thank you, June. 
Thank you, Minda. My name is June Paris. I'm a member, sorry, I'm also a member of the IRPC. What I wanted to bring to your attention is that the Zoom room is locked. I'm not sure if everybody's having the same difficulty. Um, I wasn't able to log in. Um, and I also want to commend the, the group on, on, the, on all the work they've done with interpretations and translations. And I think it's a very good group to join. And if anyone else is interested in joining, I encourage them to get involved with the IRPC. Um, we also had a working group on language within the MAG. And perhaps, I'm not sure if you've seen any of the work that that group was doing. Um, so perhaps we, you should be, the, the IRPC should try to um, look for some of these documents and see if we can join forces with them. Not sure if the group is still active. It's actually evolved to another group and it's going places. So it would be a good idea to join forces with the work that is being done um, that started with the language group. Um, so that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, June. Thank you, June, for being there as well and reporting on this session. And, and now, uh, Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to share a few thoughts. Thank you for having me here. I must admit that my last meeting that I participated in physically, um, as opposed to today, um, was in, in Vilnius during the IGF at the very early days of the coalition. And I just wanted to highlight that um, this uh, meeting is an opportunity for me to go back to catch back with all friends. Thank you, Marianne, for having me here. But I also realized listening to you guys speak how much of an impact this work has had. So looking back at the history of the coalition, I see Matthias Ketterman, I see Marianne, with whom we are now launching the Global Digital Human Rights Network, which is uh, clearly a research project. But the work that was initiated within the coalition clearly has fueled a generation of uh, human rights researchers and uh, human rights activists. And I, I, I'm, deeply concerned, I'm deeply convinced that the, these eager debates we've had around the shape of the norms, uh, around what it would mean to implement the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the online environment, has fueled research in more ways than we uh, um, imagined originally. You can see now this bold work that was put forward being transposed as um, um, Anriette and Miriam have already emphasized uh, on more platforms than just one. Just during this uh, meeting in, in Katowice, we have witnessed the European Commission regulate the work of platform workers, which is something that originally um, the uh, dynamic coalition proposed, and you can see that reflected in the charter as well. Um, I would strongly support Anne's observations that these debates, these discussions, this exercise uh, of uh, translating the principles into different languages and effectively adjusting them to different cultures, different needs, different histories, has helped us to highlight the human rights rhetoric in different international settings, has impacted the fact that the United Nations, for now in the disarmament context, recognizes international law in its entirety as applicable to cyberspace. And if that is indeed the case, all is left to do is to adjust the understanding of individual human rights to best suit the global environment. And that is a work that has already been done by the dynamic coalition. So I do hear the concerns around new rights or new circumstances where these rights will be applied. And I appreciate the conversation in the chat as well. But the work that was done by the Dynamic Coalition has helped us to understand where these challenging areas might be and has helped us to advance the dialogue in so far that we are now ready to have these conversations. I welcome further work of the coalition with regard to, for example, artificial intelligence, as we have just noted. And I just wanted to note on a personal level, I feel terribly guilty for never uh, completing the project of the Polish translation, but I view this invitation and my presence here as an opportunity to live up to that original promise. So thank you for having me here. It's a wonderful trip back in time that makes me realize the entirety of the impact that the Dynamic Coalition has had. Thank you for having me here. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you for coming as well. And uh, I will uh, uh, now, if, uh, if there's no one uh, else uh, that has a question, uh, but we will have the opportunity to ask more. And I will pass it on to uh, Marianne because- uh, um, Sorry, Minda. Yeah. Over to you. 
Yes. Uh, we seem to have a raised hand in the room that I wanted to point out. Okay. So just just to let you know, I don't want to interrupt your flow. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. Nice to see Hi. you there. Hi. So, yes. Let's let's uh, take the our the last question and then we'll go to the the, the next part of the, the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, just a very quick question. Um, I understand that this kind of documents is uh, not an official document yet adopted by the UN. It's it's a probably and hopefully it's a work in progress in that in that uh, or, or will be an inspiration for uh, for documents which will be adopted later. Um, I don't want to launch uh, to make a polemic, but uh, probably you don't know that some people on, on this uh, on the internet cannot connect to the Zoom uh, because the Zoom doesn't accept connections from their side. Uh, they track their IPs, and uh, they when they find not only the Zoom, so many, but so many applications. But for example, Zoom, which is used to to port uh, to to provide this service, cannot. Do this. It's not their option. It's being happy. It's happened this way. Uh, I don't know if this is a right being violated or not. Uh, I don't. I hope that in the future, uh, this kind of documents will try to formulate uh, a way that we can discuss if this can continue or this can be solved or, or resolved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone would like to comment, uh, or if you would like to then uh, start on this point and continue to uh, the, the discussion, I will then invite Marian to take the floor and to uh, moderate from here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Minda. Uh, because uh, Minda is now going to be part of our next round of speakers, which is, in fact, Minda, uh, Elizabeth Sharman, uh, Joanna Kalesha, and Jacob Odame Biden. So we're going to move from, you know, what the charter was, is, and its relationship to other initiatives, uh, to thinking what next, how to build on the charter, so to speak. Um, and here we have, uh, you know, the issue of timing and uh, time sensitivity. So we're going to focus a little bit on um, work that we've been doing around the environment, um, artificial intelligence implicitly, because we've been um, hosting some sessions there. And how, how can the charter in its current form, as it's currently written, with an eye to the future, how can it uh, you know, deal with emerging issues that at the time, 10 years ago, didn't quite have um, the public uh, attention, particularly environmental sustainability in fuller sense, issues around AI, and perhaps, um, Eduardo, your point um, was a very, very important point in the beginning, and still is legally, uh, what's the difference between the new right and old right uh, and a principle? So here, I think I'm going to ask Minda and Elizabeth to take the floor, our four speakers, are you all ready? Uh, because the questions you're going to address in, uh, is what to do next, how can we in, uh, involve other uh, stakeholders, like-minded initiatives, and particularly our youth um, uh, voices, and how can, um, so I think that's the first question, I think, is that the best way to do it? So you speak to that first question, um, expanding issue areas, um, updates, uh, what's happening now, what can happen next? So Minda, uh, would you like to speak to this uh, first of the two next propositions? Yes, thank you, Marian. Uh, Yes, I would possibly uh, start with the example of uh, the uh, environmental sustainability because uh, it has been a, a focus issue for us over the last few years, as well as artificial intelligence, of course. Uh, but um, environmental sustainability, because I think we, we went really a, a long way and it all started uh, uh, as the, the, the RPC has been addressing uh, over the last two, three years, articles one to four of the charter and uh, article four of the charter is the, the, the right to development uh, through the internet and looking at the article and looking at its clause beyond environmental sustainability and became very clear that uh, technologies have a huge impact on, techno on, um, on, on, on the environment. And uh, there was not much going on and not much discussion uh, 
at the um, internet governance level and ecosystems. So we started to look into it and we started to bring this discussion to um, the IGF. Um, I think 2018 was possibly our first uh, meeting on uh, environmental sustainability and the ICTs. And, uh, and then uh, by looking at, uh, in, at close B, uh, we kind of, uh, had the feeling that possibly we should do more about um, uh, about this clause because uh, Marian knows the the background story that uh, uh, we were supposed to have one more right apparently in the charter and that would be focused on environmental sustainability by the time was one too many uh, I hope that I'm <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm telling the right story uh, and, and therefore it became uh, close and uh, it's not, uh, it's very important one, but some people and some of us feel that it should be developed. Um, and how, what, what do we do uh, about it? Do we rewrite the charter? Do we include a new clause? Uh, as it has been proposed last year at our last meeting on uh, human rights and, uh, and the environment. Um, and one of the discussions led to, maybe we don't have to rewrite the charter, maybe we can build uh, upon it, but leave the original intact because it's a good document and uh, it has the basis there and then we could possibly uh, build on it. So there was the idea of, um, possibly uh, starting with um, addendums, protocols, uh, and uh, environmental sustainability, for instance, would be one that, uh, uh, one clause that would be reviewed and possibly developed. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I will stop here. I hope that I'm kind of uh, responding to your question. Yeah, thank you, Minda. Yes, recalling the idea of a protocol is a form of drilling deep which was the terms that uh, Lisa uh, Horner used uh, about the main text being the main text and coming, getting that together and then eventually drilling deeper. So protocols being an, a recognized way to develop and add new themes, updates and such like without going through, uh, reinventing the wheel as Monica quite rightly points out can be a danger. Um, what about our youth, uh, our youth uh, constituency and the fact that uh, uh, a generation of so-called digital natives are now extremely active and engaged in these topics as Eduardo students have shown and of course my own students over the last few years. So Elizabeth Shalman, I'd like you to speak to that in any way, shape or form. Um, welcome, uh, a member of the uh, Youth Forum, the Youth, uh, what is it, the Internet Youth, Internet Governance Youth and also the German Informatics Society. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. And also thank you, Minda, because what you just framed uh, really makes it easy for me to uh, to jump off of that. Um, having done for the past few years a lot of capacity building work with young people in the internet governance sphere, what I see is that young people are very much aware of many of the principles that are in the charter and they work in different aspects and in different regional contexts on those. Some of them or many of them um, maybe even without realizing that there is such a text that they could refer to. So um, before I go more into the environmental sustainability point of view, a thought that I had while you were speaking before is that this is really um, a human rights education effort that we that we have to make because it empowers um, uh, young people to um, to know that they can build on something like this that has been recognized um, and uh, has been developed in in such a such a way. Um, so this just on on the on the very basis, and I think um, myself included, and also other people in the in this sphere who uh, engage new young people in internet governance um, should refer to this more and also um, maybe as an as an activity something along the lines of train the trainers is always a good idea to um, to reach more people and then on the topic of, of environmental sustainability as you pointed out this is something that young people are very uh, very activist about but also very knowledgeable about and how this kind of um, interlinks is that 
based on the work of, of the coalition on this topic specifically then in 2019 at the youth IGF in Berlin, so the German youth IGF, and then also at the uh, youth IGF summit in Berlin. Um, this became a topic where youth messages were developed that specifically said we need to pay attention to this and um, sustainability needs to be um, looked at from from an ecological point of view, from a social point of view, and an economic point of view as well. And all of these young people that came together really agreed on this and came up uh, with, with messages and, and postulates. And they did this last year, uh, specifically in, um, in a project that I had the, um, the pleasure of coordinating, which was Youth for Digital Sustainability. We were really focused on this, but also if you look at the Youth Summit uh, this year in Poland, uh, which was done also as a collaborative project. There were also um, um, notions and postulates on, on environmental sustainability, data centers, regulation, such things. So I think there is a lot of um, activity that can really be um, reflected back on, on the charter and um, where a lot of work can be done to maybe integrate young people even more and make them aware that they can refer to this. And I see a waving hand in the room, so I will stop now and let you decide, Marilyn, if you want to, how you want to deal. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm sure we can come back. I just want just a point of order. We were Zoom bombed in the beginning, and I'm not sure if the Zoom room is open. Uh, I was wondering if our technical crew could just, um, apparently the Zoom room is locked. Uh, is it open again for people arriving later or are we in danger of being Zoom bombed again? That was a question to our support team. It's open again. Okay, all good. Okay, thank you very much. Our youth, yes. Uh, back in 2010, the Arab uprisings were taking place. And there were a significant presence of what were then young people, but 10 years on, they're not so young. <laughs> so in that respect, our youth is a moving target. So your points are well taken, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, and also the idea that um, a lot of these ideas and principles are already now taken to heart. And, and the, back then, it was still a space one conversation. So uh, it's a very fertile ground now. And on that point, I'd like to move to our next couple of speakers, Joanna and Jacob, to talk about, you know, how can the Charter help advance, uh, you know, national, if not regional, national, even local um, initiatives trying to educate and make aware uh, leaders, community leaders, um, educators, judiciaries, particularly local judges, perhaps. Um, how can the Charter help in that work? And uh, please speak to this in your own way and what makes sense to you. I'll start with Joanna. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. That is indeed a very valid question, uh, especially in these challenging times where human rights are uh, a topic of uh, an intense political debate, not just in Central and Eastern Europe, where we virtually are uh, meeting in a hybrid format today, but universally. So, so the work that the coalition, as I so excitedly emphasized, has done thus far is a phenomenal background for further educational activities um, in, in whatever capacity those can have. And now, speaking of the research background that the coalition has provided, you can see this happening with the current generation of researchers who are trying to feed the human rights narrative in their own institutions. Could be in universities like mine, could be organizations, NGOs that focus on human rights. There is a lot of work that's being done to that same aim for example, by the Council of Europe, again, looking at the regional um, landscape here, and those activities are targeted at specific communities, including judges, for example. So wherever the um, Council of Europe sees an opportunity to advance the awareness about human rights, um, it uh, puts in place a dedicated project, which is wonderful, and that's a great way to do it. And there is also work by the Fundamental Rights Agency when it comes to thematic areas, and it stems from the very same source. So you guys looked at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the paramount example of human rights. All is left to do is to detail that to the needs of current uh, societies. So the Fundamental Rights Agency does this, for example, right now, targeted at artificial intelligence. There's a huge project there. 
Um, but I'm trying to cherry pick examples of the work that the Charter has influenced to try and present a common denominator. I have done a lot of work with regards to cybersecurity. There is now this debate around a cybersecurity curriculum. We're looking at a cybersecurity professional and we're trying to figure out what it means. Now, not only does this professionalized cybersecurity curriculum means human rights understanding and awareness, but when I was listening to you guys speak and looking at that decade of work that has provided such tangible output, I'm thinking about building a human rights curriculum that would combine these exercises. I'm not saying there isn't work being done. Yes, there is, and this is happening everywhere. And I welcome a new generation of human rights policy developers. I don't want to say just researchers or activists, but there are policies, comprehensive policies being put in place. I welcome that. There is an intense debate in Poland and elsewhere uh, around what human rights mean. Let's just look at freedom of expression online. The one could say uh, Eurocentric concept of hate speech. Where does it start and where do we draw the line? These are pertinent policy questions that the uh, uh, coalition, the dynamic coalition has provided comprehensive answers to. So I think that might be the platform to further develop. I've seen dynamic coalitions working on different um, areas of internet governance, some of whom are represented in the Zoom room and in the room in Katowice. Um, I've seen those developed into a well-structured network that follow a certain curriculum. If there was an avenue for the charter to be transposed onto a professional training curriculum of what human rights mean when put online, I think that would be wonderful. And that's my inspiration. That's my takeaway from this particular panel. But generally speaking, I think that you guys have the capacity to offer trainings, not just through individual institutions or supporting those, which I know is happening. And the Dynamic Coalition has, as already said, produced human rights professionals, if you will, that do their work in their own regions or in their own countries, as I'm trying to do at the University of Lodz myself. But I think that you have provided a framework that could easily be transposed onto a professionalized human rights training. So I wanted to thank you for that. And, and I think that might be part of the answer, although I, I have no claim of providing a comprehensive one. So that's all I have at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Yes, the bridge between the technical communities, the lawmakers, the human rights activists, and the internet policy. That was, that was the premise of the charter project in the beginning and is still um, its basic um, um, animating factor. Jacob, you've been doing amazing work uh, in your community and with your uh, network. So we'd love to hear about how you see the Charter inspiring, informing, or providing perhaps a backbone for your work and what uh, you've been doing so we can uh, learn from you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I was trying to undo my video, but it's, it's, it's difficult to uh, uh, bring up my video. So I think I would make do with uh, as it is now. That's OK. So thank you very much. Yes, I became uh, IRPC steering committee member uh, beginning of this year. And I got introduced to the charter. Uh, very simple, straight to the point, uh, 10 points charter. And that resonates with me because I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I'm passionate about human rights. So uh, in Ghana, I'm affiliated uh, with EGECFA. EGECFA is E-Governance and Internet Governance Foundation for Africa. And uh, we organize the annual internet, Ghana Internet School, Ghana School on Internet Governance. And for this year, for instance, one of our major themes was basically to focus on, on digital rights. So as part of my speech, uh, I was speaking on the topic human rights in the digital age. And I decided to actually make the charter my, you know, my, my main focus. So in this uh, group uh, that's comprised of our fellows, about 30 fellows, I did a presentation to them. We had various stakeholders from civil society, you know, technical community. But most importantly, we had uh, people from the government side. Uh, and so you could sense like from the, uh, from the presentation, they really, it was an eye opener for them because they understand uh, that human rights 
is, is, is actually fundamental and has a place in our national constitution, but they really could not relate how uh, it exists in, 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 in digital, uh, digital spaces. And illustrations like, you know, internet uh, shutdown, for instance, that is prevalent uh, in our region actually brought uh, that to perspective that when, for instance, the internet goes off, then you can point to association because you cannot uh, collaborate in a time like COVID where uh, fiscal meetings uh, were limited, but the way that people could actually mobilize and, 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 and communicate uh, was to use uh, online platforms. And then, of course, uh, issues concerning like freedom of expression. So they basically saw that connection and uh, they were so excited and uh, that uh, we introduced uh, their coalition to them. And I think uh, Minda, Minda testified to it that that day we saw a spike. So we had a lot of people from uh, my community joining, uh, joining our coalition. And I have seen active uh, work participation, uh, they following the work of the coalition. And then, so this happened around the 30th, uh, 30th of June. And then uh, on the 24th to 26th of August also, I got invited from uh, our friends from Cameroon uh, during the ICT Africa Symposium. And again, I presented the same, the same topic and uh, I got basically the same, uh, the same reaction. So what I basically uh, sense or picked is that we need to uh, continue with this effort, uh, uh, seize uh, the platform and opportunities to be able to uh, uh, present this work because it is very fertile. People really resonate and, and, and identify that human rights uh, issues. They understand that you know, it's a very topical issue, but then uh, the temptation is that people find themselves like using the internet and stuff and they do not really uh, know that connection that you know this, uh, 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 human rights, which is fundamental, need to be guarded, especially as we are all moving towards uh, uh, digital environments for uh, how we go about our things, how we go to school, how we uh, assess services, and how we collaborate, uh, collaborate and all. So uh, that's my contribution uh, based on the work that I have done here in Ghana and uh, on the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. I put the link up. I believe I hope that's the right one. Uh, Ghana is uh, for that, that, that's, that right correct. Okay. that's correct. Okay, that's correct. Thank you so much. And uh, now I'm just doing a time check with Minda. We uh, this session goes until 20 past the hour. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um we have a little bit of time for some open discussion. Uh, we have a question from the floor from Amir, uh, which I've answered to some respect by uh, pasting in the charter page, uh, the aims and principles of the charter, uh, which we um, is to effect, is to generate this conversation and to, I think, to become um, a touchstone, a, a point of reference as Joanna has, um, has put so well, and an inspiration as Jacob has attested to, and a form of accountability, as Elizabeth has noted, in terms of uh, who are the audience to whom and from whom it speaks. Um, and as Minda rightly points out, the next steps need to be to perhaps uh, uh, develop points in the charter, articles and sub-clauses of those articles as protocols, which in itself is a whole writing exercise um, and requires quite a bit of time and attention. So those are the kind of themes coming through from the second part. We have a question in the room Elizabeth, uh, has someone got a mic to hand to that person? Uh, a mic is available, so I... Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. Oh, Andre, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Yes. Uh, nice, nice to meet you all. Uh, nice to meet you, Marin. Nice to meet you all. Uh, and now I'm representing uh, McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And so um, I have some observations about that, um, about uh, the issues discussed. First of all, about the use uh, and uh, <clears throat> attraction of the use. So uh, when I uh, teach in my uh, course on human rights on the internet, I always give them opportunity to create the, the draft international legal documents on the human rights 
on the internet. Uh, it could be good uh, student project and uh, it could be good uh, project how to, uh, to to show what what uh, are they do what, what are they thinking of in creation this uh, kind of instruments. Uh, that's my first observation. The second observation is, uh, I think, uh, um, the good thing is to organize something like the model United Nations uh, with the topic of the human rights online. And what will be created there, uh, that will be a great surprise. Uh, also there in Montreal, I uh, initiated, uh, let's say, the working group to create the Universal Declaration of digital rights. And uh, we have a seminar uh, last month uh, about there. Uh, and let's say what will happen with the student, student, student community. And other issues about the unchangeability and uh, um, um, the and the document as a living document. I think the good idea is not, is to create protocols to uh, the charter on specific uh, issues, like it was done, for example, for European uh, Convention of Human Rights or uh, other human rights instruments, just to create protocols on new issues or emerging issues in human rights protection. But I think uh, the, uh, the that's my general observation is to go to and prepare to implementation of the document. Let's uh, say that uh, we have a, a mandate uh, to be revised after 2025, and I hope uh, the forum itself will will, get, uh, will receive the opportunity to adopt soft law instruments and that uh, and this atmosphere would like to uh, let's say uh, to adopt it as a, uh, officially as international legal instrument uh, which would be based for uh, all kind of digital rights uh, uh, and i think uh, that would be a good idea and before 2025 we should uh, have a text to be actually prepared for this implementation. I think uh, there is no uh, obstacles for to implement it is uh, to implement it officially at the UN level. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Andre, and also thank you, Andre, who translated the charter uh, into Russian um, and published it, and also a second volume of commentary on. Uh, the charter in Russian. So Andre, we're still we're looking forward to the PDF so we can uh, have that um, version of the Russian translation up on our website as well. Uh, the issue about what goes next, whether a new document is needed and at the highest possible level, I think is coming from the floor from Amir. Uh, before I turn to Amir's question, um, Minda, did you want to um, make a point here? Yeah, it's just building on uh, what Andre just said, because uh, I, I also believe that uh, we should really look, and as we have been discussing at the RPC, um, at uh, some developments on emerging issues like artificial intelligence, environmental sustainability, and so on. And and uh, and yes, I I also agree that uh, what one of my ideas uh, that inspired me on possibly going this route was uh, the convention, um, the European Convention on Human Rights, because I think it's a uh, great that you can see the original document and uh, and then you have all the protocols that follow obviously but you can always go there and see article two and and the provisions that uh, at the time made sense but you know that these days were not be wouldn't be possible and and other protocols came and were ratified and therefore the provision initial provision just doesn't exist anymore but it's still there it gives you a, a perspective on and on this living document and i think that this uh, charter is a living document and therefore uh, needs to be developed thank you and now uh, we have a question or comment from amir uh, about uh, uh, the relationship between the charter and and a digital 
Global Digital Compact of SG. I'm a little unclear which uh, document's being referred to here. Um, I think in the sense that the charter is one of uh, the beginning of a long chain, like a like a, a genealogy, and the charter itself didn't begin from nothing, as we have in the chat. So uh, perhaps the, the next question is uh, the strategic question of drilling down as Lisa Horner and both Minda Murray were two, two chairs of the coalition from each end of its um, timeline at present saying we need to go deeper, we need to unpack um, certain provisions already written in the charter, not by rewriting the charter, but by unpacking and uh, that way to implement it. Um, so that's the answer to uh, the charter relationship to some, some high level initiatives that are in the air now. There's some word of treaties, there's um, the digital cooperation initiative that um, that the UN uh, Secretary General is uh, is leading. Uh, there are many, we could say, competitors. We could say it's a very competitive domain, but I think that would be missing the point of these initiatives enormously and reducing uh, collaborative work and cross-sector work to a sort of marketplace of um, survival of the fittest. And I think that would be a real shame. No, yet, nonetheless, it is a reality. So I think we need to move to sort of summation and final takeaways at that point. Um, unless there are other comments. We also have from Amir, his, uh, he was wondering about the Charter on Justice, Ethics and Morality. Uh, the Charter of Internet Right of um, the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet uh, is embedded in the UN uh, treaties and covenants, which uh, address ethics, address justice, and address morality. Um, but none of these documents are set in stone, as Linda quite rightly points out. So at this point, I'd like to ask our speakers to, uh, unless there's anything from the room, I'll just pause for a minute. Has anyone got any comments, questions, challenges from the floor in the room or on Zoom before we start rounding up? No? Okay, well, I'm just going to, we've got um, Eduardo, Mari Grazia, we have Elizabeth, we have Minda, we have Jacob, and we have Joanna. So I'll uh, just to get you thinking, one sentence statement on the future of the charter. And then I have the dubious privilege of wrapping it up. So I will refrain from my one sentence and make uh, that at the end uh, as a form of um, outro. Shall we start with... Um, Maria Grazia, are you still with us? Eduardo, ah, oh, there you are. Maria, well, for you, given the experience you've just had, what's your one sentence statement on the future of the charter as you've experienced and translated it? Well, what I can say is, is that my presence here is an example, you know, of what we're talking about, so of inclusion and the importance of involving more and more different background experiences so I really believe in this and these actions, I think that are not only necessary, but strongly needed. And so I think that situations like this are uh, happening more and more. And I've been very, it's, it has been a pleasure for me being part of this. And I'm speaking on behalf of all the students. So we, we hope to see things like this on the future more and more. And um so yeah i'm um, so it's a pleasure for me thank you maria thank you for all your work eduardo as uh one of the leaders in the italian uh edition uh, what, what are your thoughts for the future of the charter itself in its current form or its extended form eduardo okay we'll come back to eduardo santosh Uh, thank you, Marian. I think this is a very troubling time uh, we are passing through. Uh, and it is not only the governments, but the big tech companies as well. And this charter, this charter it portrays the values we believe in, and it is based on the human rights. So looking at the example from uh, my own country, we are going through our lawmaking processes. We are having new information technology bill, cybersecurity policy, and everything. And these are the kind of uh, framework or these are the kind of larger framework that we have to work on to make the upcoming laws and the policies. So I see the very much value on it. And at the same time, we have to work on the new generation, young people, 
policy makers, tech companies, everyone. So this is very valuable. And uh, uh, because we are uh, referring to it as a living document, we have to also address the upcoming challenges and make it more timely so that it is not discarded, but uh, would be more useful in coming days. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Santosh. Uh, Jacob, for your part, the future of the charter, the work. Is Jacob still with us or has he been knocked off? Okay, can't see Jacob. Uh, Joanna. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I keep thinking about making this uh, uh, um, a tangible input into the discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that there is room for um, a, a structured cooperation working at the university. I keep thinking about research projects, but what I'm also thinking is about uh, um, the social media presence, the work you guys are doing is so amazing that I'm certain that there is more room to have this advertised. And as you rightfully noted, these partnerships with the governments as uh, the IGF has made possible, for example, through this meeting, or partnerships with the technical community and that many of the IGF participate, participants are happy to facilitate. I just saw Olivier drop by. So I'm certain that there is room for that message to be carried on into the technical community as well, as well as other civil society organizations, not so closely linked to the IGF, but for example, participating at the IGF in Katowice right now mm -hmm. gives a lot of opportunity to promote the work, which in itself is so highly valuable that it offers direct uh, guidance on, on pertinent current human rights online issues. And, and I keep going back to AI, but uh, just as you could see at the opening ceremony with young people barging onto the street, with, uh, onto the stage with banners and, and highlighting the need to protect platform workers, you guys have the solutions in place. So, so I believe that there is room indeed for A, modifying the charter to best address the challenges, as Minda was saying, but also to propagate it across different communities. And I myself volunteered to, to help uh, achieve that aim. I will work on that Polish translation as initially okay. indicated. I, I'm not putting a deadline on it, but, but I think that would be tremendously useful, especially since the intense human rights debates we are having in yeah. Poland right now. And I will stop at that diplomatic summary. Again, thank you for having me. It's been wonderful to see uh, the long road that the community has has gone through. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, as always. Elizabeth, did we did I give you the floor for this final takeaway? Not yet, but there you go, you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marian. Thank you, Marian. A, a lot of smart and true things have been said uh, already. I think the charter as it stands is already is a wonderful tool, not only as it has been laid out to hold states and powerful actors accountable, but also to empower different and sometimes marginalized groups in the digital policy space. And I think going forward, it is really, it should be, and it is from what I'm seeing, a continuous effort to include those groups actively in the work and in the processes um, uh, to, revisit and uh, further develop the topics that, that were talked about. And youth is just one of those, uh, those groups, so to speak. Um, but we also always have to think about other marginalized communities that I want to highlight on this point. And mm. thank you very much for also. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Eduardo, you're back. Um, we just one sentence takeaway, the future of the charter. Yes, many thanks, Marianne, and apologies. It's, it's like okay. It happens. Urgent call to take. Anyway, yes, I just wanted to thank everyone for this session. And in terms of like next steps, I really look forward to launch the the paper version of the of the Italian Charter in, in Trieste uh, next year. Because as Marianne said, it's really important to hold in in our ends, uh, and uh, I hope that this will be a very important instrument. Uh, uh, of like advocacy within Italy and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Minda, who's been championing our, our outreach on the new, the topics that were just mooted in this charter and really taking them places. What is your dream for the next stage? Thank you, Marianne. It has been, uh, you know, I've joined the RPC quite a few years ago and uh, my job was basically just helping with the social media and the, the website and 
and then I joined the steering committee and then the last uh, four years um, co-chairing uh, has been intense work and I had hoped to do much more uh, at least uh, what I was uh, supposed to do that was the outreach of the charter but we are all volunteers and I do think that we have done a lot but a lot more uh, still needs to be done and uh, you know uh, I, I could see that Santos had some ideas on the chart I completely agree with Joanna as well uh, and Eduardo and you know there are also other projects that we have been drilling in but not being able to then uh, take for just because of time and I, I, I talk about for instance the, the educational resources guide uh, with case studies, uh, you know, that was also another uh, build on the charter. So um, uh, another important one would be that the, the charter itself is recognized as an output of the IGF. And that's, that hasn't happened yet, but we're hopeful that at some point uh, this will happen. And uh, hopefully very soon, because the... the 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 IGF is looking into the the work of the the um, dynamic coalitions and trying to uh, get these outputs out there. So this is something that I think is important too. And then obviously collaboration with other uh, stakeholders. And uh, so many times we come across people at IGFs when we could be there face to face who are working with the charter that we had no idea and from all around the world and the important work that they have been doing. So getting these people together, working, collaborating with them, reaching out, also other projects, right? Uh, tomorrow we will have a discussion with, uh, with several uh, human rights uh, documents uh, that uh, basically were born within the IGF. And I think these conversations are important because at the end of the day, what we aim for is to make sure that human rights exist online as they should do offline. So we cannot do this alone. We need everyone to work uh, together and to do this with us. So I, I hope that in the future and the next 10 years, this, all, this, all this will happen and, uh, and, and that we will finally have human rights online as we all have also human rights offline, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Minda. We're nearly out of time and I think it's all been said. My final comments would be, uh, my dream is that this is a living document, but like all living organisms, it needs feeding and sustenance and support and air to breathe in all its diverse cultural and economic political forms. My second point is to echo Joanna and Minda's concerns about the constant erosion of human rights online and offline. And at the intersection, which is now where most of us live, horrendous things are happening to journalists through being tracked and surveilled through uh, um, tracking technologies. Horrendous things are happening at borders right now as we speak, uh, using mobile devices to track and attack. Uh, asylum seekers. Human rights are as difficult, as fragile, and as important as they ever were. They're not perfect. The covenants and treaties and documents in the UN are not perfect. They're constantly being revised. So uh, Minda's historical sense I certainly endorse, and I wish the Charter a happy another 10 years so it can leave, uh, it can reach middle age and uh, still be considered important. So my final point is I call to the IGF as a UN uh, as a UN project to formally recognize the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet as a formal output of the Internet Governance Forum and its dynamic coalition, because the Internet Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition is in fact a fusion of two other dynamic coalitions, and we work closely with all stakeholders. I think the time has come for this document to be officially recognized and footnoted, because if you can't be Googled, you don't exist on the online environment, but we exist nonetheless and we can continue our work. Thanks everyone for being here, for inspiring us and for teaching us and we'll all touch base afterwards. We'll let you know about the next round of elections for incoming steering committee and an incoming co-chair and all those kinds of business details on the listserv. Thank you everyone, uh, be safe, have fun, stay well and uh, good night. Thank you. Thanks everyone, bye. Thanks so much, bye-bye. Bye-bye.